<laughs> okay, are wait. you gonna let her out of the recording closet? <gasps> Look at it. Is it <laughs> a, ooh. It's a folder. It's like an old Trapper Keeper folder. And then Oh my they are running. Oh, they're be running. Free. Be free. Right? Run like the wind. Look at that. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? I know I'm very excited. It's like the greatest moment of my life right here. Yeah. So you're just gonna keep that ruler on your desk and just move it so they're running. Mm -hmm. So Someone you're not gonna get any, any work done, are you? Nope. Nope. It's just all downhill from here. It's all horses. I, I feel like <laughs> wildfires playing in the background. <laughs> Oh, they're running. Yeah, Patrick Swayze's shirtless riding one somehow. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Of course. But right. So I, um, there's a, this thing that occurred to me this morning that I don't know if I told you the story and I like wanted to get it down on tape before I forgot again, especially during this election season. Randy, do you, want, you can yeah. come out of the closet if you want. <laughs> you can come out and get back to the other stuff and go back yeah. to listening to one side of the conversation because it's way more fun. So I feel like, especially since uh, we're so close to the election and there's this whole talk about um, voting and irregularities and such. So a friend of mine was making this documentary that uh, the subject of which doesn't matter, but they were down in Atlanta to interview uh, Jimmy Carter. And by the way, if you give him a piece of paper to sign like as a release form and he mm -hmm. asks, what's this for? And you jokingly mm -hmm. say, oh, it's to give back your Nobel Prize. He doesn't think it's funny. Oh, well, I probably yeah. wouldn't. Yeah. So um, so after the shoot, uh, the crew retires to a local eatery to unwind uh, and it's Hooters. Of course. Okay. Have I told you this story? No. Okay. And so um, I'm assuming because they're all from New York and have pretentious facial hair and probably rode like a bunch of penny farthings to the Hooters, the waitresses were like, you're not from around here. Uh -huh. and, and so they start talking about what they're doing there and all of this. And one, one of the waitresses says, you know, you should do a, a documentary about the elections in our county for the sheriff because there are all these voting irregularities on the uh, register. I don't think they use the words irregularities and register, but you get the point. Yeah, stop underestimating uh, the Hooters girls. I know, I'm sorry. I apologize to all of our Hooters waitresses who are listening. I'm sorry, Hooters servers. Yes. Man, they got to be taking a bath with COVID, don't they? That's I guess. But everybody needs wings. Well, yeah, and they are, what, delightfully tacky and... Something unrefined. I used to know their mm, tagline. That, yeah, I do not, but it would make sense that you <laughs> know your. It would. Um, have you been? I've never actually been to one. Oh, yeah, I've been to several. Are the wings good? They are pretty good. Well, they are? Because yeah. who was it who said, like, oh, no one goes to Hooters for wings? But if that's their thing, I mean, well, that's one of their things so that's just one of their things i've yeah. always been like thoroughly grossed out i mean we need to go back to your story but it's always no. really bothered me mm -hmm. that they had to wear those really thick awful mm -hmm. nylons and the white reebok high tops under the shorts it was mm -hmm. it's, it's not fair right you think that's they... why at least when they did that like tilted kilt thing or whatever at least they had like little kilts and it was a little the outfits were nicer mm. That's interesting. Yeah, I guess they all have. Like, to do if that. I want to be objectified serving mm -hmm. wings, at least right. let me feel adorable. Mm, that's a good point. It's a very, very good point. Although, I guess, is it more flattering if you don't look adorable, and people are still drooling over you? Then you know, like, even in this awful tacky outfit, right. yeah. I'm still gorgeous. So, I guess that is a good way to go. But I think all of them, and and we can get back to the story in a second. I think all of them, maybe are. are beautiful on the inside. This is Why, with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. So one of the waitresses says there are all these irregularities on the voting roll. And she said, like, for example, over on, you know, Main Street, one of the... Uh, people who voted is, is this tree that's on main street 
and the other waitresses, and there's not <laughs> even a tree on Main Street. So oh, what? I, <laughs> Scandal. I know that was that's the story. I just love. I love it. It's not well, my did story. They investigate to tell. it further. They did not, um, and it's not my story to tell. I was not there, but there's no way he's listening to this. So you know what? We got to fill up some time. That. Well, uh, I think I do. Trust me on this one. Maybe Jimmy Carter's listening to it. Oh, please. And we would, would never here. take back his Nobel Prize. No, I was just going to say, is he our second Nobel Prize listener? Because we got to have one somewhere, right? Oh, I'm sure. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe Mark. Probably. Can you get a Nobel Prize for streaking? You should. Yeah, like a peace if prize. We, if we had our own version of the Nobel mm. Prizes. Yeah. Streaking probably less, a category. Yeah, probably less prestigious than the real ones. I don't know. I think it could be cool. So, again, let's discuss here dog brew made by Bush. Huh. Yes, it's it's the newest right. I thought this was. I thought this was a joke. No, this is insane. Yeah. So, for those people who, for some reason, don't know that. Bush also makes beer for dogs. Uh, it's made out of bone broth. So it's good for you, right? Right. Made with vegetable, herbs, spices, water, and pork broth. So that's oh. like pretty much Bush, right? Just regular beer? Yeah, pretty uh -huh. much. Uh, to provide your buddy, best buddy, best buddy, with a nutritious and tasty snack that helps promote a di healthy digestive system. Well, this sounds like something we should be getting for Captain. We should be getting it for Captain. If he's having like... a little, you know. Yeah. If he's, see, having, if he's yeah. got the COVID-19. Have you heard about that one? Literally. No, the, no, no, not that. No, the COVID-19 is the weight everyone has gained from oh, beer eating gotcha. sleeves of Oreos. Or maybe that's just me. No, I've been eating sleeves of Oreos, but I've been working out like crazy. So I'm kind of like balanced out that's a great way to take something negative and make it positive right look at me yeah i know i'm just See my, uh, eating my beer. Other, yeah. well you know but the yeah. other thing that's great about this beer mm -hmm. is yes it would be lovely to get it for captain we'll see if he's what kind of sea captain he is right is he yeah. a you know saucy lad or what but it's also fantastic because the branding is just normal enough that mm -hmm. you so could just have it in the fridge and wait to see which friend takes it out of the fridge. And that to me is worth all the pork butt in the beer. That's true. That's true. And then also what's interesting, I just clicked on the buy dog brew because there's a few of these things we've looked at before for the show. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, I think I sent it to you, the dog ketchup or the dog mayo mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. put on. That. that sounds disgusting, but they're completely sold out of everything. So see? people, someone's buying it. Right. So I thought like, well, let's see if anyone has bought the uh, dog brew by Bush. You click on the button to buy the brew. First thing you have to do, they check your ID. Right. Are you of age to be buying beer for your dog? Well, and is it dog years or like human years? Ooh, good, right. good question. Just a quick note about this week's interview. We recorded our conversation with Colette several weeks ago and prior to the recent events in Kenosha and Portland. And so that is why they don't come up during our conversation. This is likely a stupid question, but how often do guys try to quiz you on your football knowledge? Guys try to quiz me all the time. And I think in the beginning, I would answer all their questions about, you know, uh, Five four defenses, three four defenses versus a, a four three, and then I started thinking like, wait a minute, these guys are not asking the men on the panel the same right. questions they're asking right. me. So then I started to become into my own, and I was like, you know what? My response to a reporter or someone interview me or asking me a question would turn to, well, for mind you, I would answer the question because I love football. Right? Right. right. I'm all about it. 
But then I started surmising and I was cognizant of the fact that they're not asking the men the same questions they're asking me. So then I started stopping. I started stopping all this rhetoric. And I was like, you know what? I'll answer that question if it's a question for everybody on the panel. <laughs> and then it became, oh, like, and I'm like, what? <laughs> right? What's the deal? <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a lot. It, it, it happens a lot. Um, if you have any idea about the very few men that I've ever dated in my life, um, that know my history, that know what I'm about, that know my values, and that I found myself worth being a human being, that know the struggles I face because I'm a woman that will say the most idiotic, stupid shit to me ever. <laughs> and then they wonder why I don't return their phone calls anymore. <laughs> right? So it is something that we as women, unfortunately, face. You know, I want to break the cycle on that. I'm just all about hiring the right person. Everybody has a fair shake. That's it. Right. It's, How crazy is that? I know. <laughs> It's revolutionary. A really, yeah, a really yeah. bizarre concept. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Your whole story is wonderful and inspiring, and I want to make sure we touch on it all. But to kind of find a place to start, you're in New York, you're working on re in real estate. What led you to, I don't want to say think you could try out for the New York Sharks, but to just say, yeah, I'm going to go do this? You know, that's a, that is such a loaded question that... <laughs> is so profound and so simplistic at the exact same moment. Um, I was a kid, right? We all were children at some point and we all gravitated towards certain sports or games. And for me, I just loved football the way in my, in, in my silly me, just <laughs> because I just like that sport, I want to play it. So because back in those in that era i'm 51 years old so imagine you know 40 years ago how it was it's still bad today mm -hmm. um however back then it was a lot worse for women for girls so silly me for just being a kid that just gravitated towards football and was told you're not allowed to play because you're a girl and it never i never quite understood it was almost like if you see a really good movie and a moment makes you cry and you're like, oh my God, he broke his heart. Or that poor puppy is just a puppy. Rescue the puppy. That was me in a, in a realm that I couldn't understand. And I couldn't understand how my dad, who's my greatest hero to this very day, just kind of let it go. You know, cause he, you ever heard, you ever heard the phrase eat the cake anime? Mm -hmm. The Tina Marie movie, the, the, yes. the, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. right. Eat the cake, anime. She had an abusive boy. Just eat right. the cake. Well, you know what? I'm not eating the goddamn cake. Yep. If I want cake, I'll cut a piece. If, I, if, I, if, I, if I want a piece of cake, I'll bake a goddamn cake. <laughs> right? yes. And I'll let you have some. Right. I'll share. Often, either have a slice or not. You know, so why is that just not the norm, right? So I remember the market was on a, in, in real estate, it was, I was making amazing money. I thought I was like Queen Sheba, right? Queen Nzinga. And I'm like traveling and I could shop wherever I wanted. I'm like, oh, I love that cashmere coat. Give me two of them. <laughs> and they're like, what? I'm like, because yeah, I love the style and it may fade at some point. So. I'll have a backup, you know? Sure. And Makes I was living sense. like that, and then the market crashes, and then I'm sitting on my couch, oh. and I'm literally smoking in Newport. I was enjoying it, too. And I'm, I'm drinking a 40 ounce of Coke 45, right? Because the market crashed. I was at home. I was not used to being home. I was used to hitting the streets, doing business, having meetings. Um, I specialize in new development marketing. So for me, it was always about being with the men in the suits. And I was the only woman there, let alone the only black person in the room. And I just happened to see women's pro football tryouts. 
And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. This has got to be a joke. Someone's playing a prank on me. <laughs> and there was no prank. I looked into it a little bit more and I was like, nope. No fucking way. Kidding me? And I went to the tryouts and it was the last tryouts of the season for that that season. And uh, I think it was a Tuesday that I saw a Tuesday or Wednesday. Tryouts were that Saturday. And I went and I said, there's no way I'm not gonna go. I know I will not make the team because I'm in my I'm, I was 42 at the time. I wasn't working out. I wasn't an athlete anymore the way I used to be as a child or in high school or college running track and things like that. Look, the sports that I was allowed to play. Right. Right. Gender, <laughs> right? Silly me. And so I went to tryouts. And um, it was it was the most aha moment to see women in full equipment. Not that lingerie bullshit right. that we see. <laughs> with the women the, the stripper girls with a with a modified helmet on give me a break you know you want dollar bills go to the strip club bring a pole don't bring a football okay it's a and different so party I that when I saw these women out there and full equipment real equipment and coaches yelling at them and the team camaraderie and the unity and the and the sisterhood which sounds so crazy because normally when you say football is brotherhood, but there was, right. such a, it was such, yeah. it was so eye opening to me that at that very moment, I became the woman that always lived inside of me that I never, never ever let out or never knew existed. And it was like a breath of fresh air and a whisper from God. Did I say whisper? A yell in my ear from God <laughs> about how, to, to know your worth. That's amazing. I love it. When we were researching everything you're doing, I just it's your story is so phenomenal. But you know, I'm in my 40s, so I see my friends wanting to pursue their dreams at this age and and being afraid to do it and going, "Oh, I'm too old for it." You just fucking went out and did it and changed <laughs> yeah. the world while you were doing it. Like, Game I love on. it. Game and, on. And why you know, not, right? Why, and, and why not? You know what? There's a um, Nelson Mandela. He said sometimes, he said, who am I to be great? Who am I? Like we're questioning ourselves. Well, who are you not to be great? Bottom wow. line. Bottom right. line. Yeah. You know what? There's no, there's no dishonor in losing a race. There's only dishonor in not racing. So That's let's it. go, let's go. get, get your ass, get up <laughs> and let's go. <laughs> I love it. That's amazing. And so you played for, I think it was three seasons, right? Yeah. Well, if you want to call it that, it was, it was, it was on paper, it's three years, three seasons, but I didn't uh, get a lot of playing time because I was always injured with my old ass, but <laughs> you know, Doesn't but I'll tell you, I, I never missed a practice. Um, if I was injured, I did modified workouts with my team. And I remember we would do, you, you know what the um, suicides are, right? Suicides. Mm -hmm. And so you have to run that football field, the whole oh, yeah. 120 yards, mm -hmm. you know, three times. And we hated it. We always hated that portion of practice. I wouldn't be able to do it because I had bad knees and a bad back. At some point it was really bad. And I would do mountain climbers. And okay. I remember I wouldn't stop doing my mountain climbers until the last girl finished the line. And I'd always curse them out afterwards, like, come on! Oh my God, I can't even do this. <laughs> <laughs> until they finish, I'm still doing my mountain climbers. You know, my modified oh my workout. But it was it's it's just it's it's a hunger. So yeah, I played for three seasons. Um I didn't get a lot of playing time, but it was the best time of my life ever. Well, if it's, and you played, you played professional football. Like yes. it doesn't, I, I mean, it doesn't matter how much playing time you got. You played professional football, which is unreal. And then you're one of the few people who have been a shark and a jet. When I got promoted, if you want to call a promotion from, I, I went from being a player to a coach for my women's protein. From that point, 
the owner of my team said, we want you to do the marketing and the PR. Okay. And I was honored to do that, you know, and the GM, the, our general manager said, well, Colette, you know what? You've already been doing it since day one. It's just been unofficial. So let's just make it happen. And you have a title. And I'm like, oh my God, yeah, yeah. I love my, I love my new family, right? And so, I mean, I didn't get paid much money. I got maybe $300 for a whole season for work around the clock. Oh. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> and um, I got cursed out regularly by my father who said, you made hundreds of thousands of dollars in real estate and now you're devoting all your time and efforts and energy to this women's team, are you crazy? And I'm like, for me, it was a, re it was a, it was an awakening. It was a, it was a re being reborn. So I did that, and when it came time to marketing, I took it very seriously. So I figured, well, there are two teams in New York: the Giants and the Jets. Mm -hmm. I'm a Jets girl, so I'm reaching out to the Jets. Mm -hmm. And so I kept hitting them and hitting them with just emails and social media, and tagging them, talking about the Jets, our brothers to the sisters of women's pro football, New York men professional, New York women's professional. Hey, 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 hey. And it went, I just was very strategic about it. Um, the same way I, I coached was very strategic. You know your personnel, you know who's gonna do the, who's going to accomplish the, the assignment the way you want it seen in your brain, mm -hmm. right? So it was strategic for me. And so somebody called me from the Jets front offices and I had a major attitude that day, <laughs> major attitude, because no, I, I got a lot of phone calls from guys. No offense, but I was going to ask what that looked like compared to normal, I know. <laughs> like us talking here. You know, my, father, you know, my, dad, my dad was like, oh hell, here we go again. Um, I just don't like stupidity, you know? So for me, if you're stupid yes. and I'm teaching you and you're still saying no, I have no time for that book, right? So I um, had an attitude and the guy, when I found, because mind you, the, the reason why I had an attitude, because I had so many men that would call me or reach me on social media and say, hey, I heard about your women's pro football team. So you guys really play on a real football field. Oh, and I'm like, what the hell? So imagine <laughs> getting, I mean, like they pretty much should have said, do you use a real football? Um, oh my God. You know, right. <laughs> and, and so when this phone call came in and I was like, here we go again. And then it was the front office in the New York, <laughs> the New York Jets. I was like, oh shit, wait, who are you? I like, wait, wait. Like, real quick. <laughs> I was like, oh, my dad, sorry. <laughs> so the, the guy and I had a, an amazing conversation and it just went, I guess he could hear my passion about football, my passion, my knowledge, my no give up attitude, my, my empowerment for my women that play football. And look, do I love my New York team? Of course I did. But the other 100 women pro football teams, they need help. Too. We all need help together, collectively. So he was like, oh, my God. He goes, I've never met anybody like you. And I'm like, what team did you say you work for? Because, like, all those guys should be around by who I am, right? <laughs> so it just kind of happened. <laughs> and um, he got me on-field access. I didn't ask for on-field access. He offered it. And I was thinking like, well, how's that going to help my team? You giving me unfilled access. Like, it's like, that's cute and everything that you, that you know, I'm a fan of the Jets, but that's not going to help my team. That's good for a fan. Woo. -hoo, you know, but I want to help my women in football. And when I thought about it more, I said, wait a minute, I'm going to have clear on-field access to private practices. I can learn to be a better coach. I'm a good coach. Now I'll be a great coach. Freaking super. So he made that happen. And I remember when he finally made it happen, he called me and he goes, okay, I got you in for this day at this time. He said to me, you're not going to need me anymore. Because mind you, he was my kind of in with the Jets because um, we had formed a good relationship. He knew I was a quality person. 
I thought he was as well. And he said, you're not going to need me anymore. So, you know, you could, you could lose my number, but feel free to call me if you want to, but you're not going to need me. And I'm like, what do you mean? You're not leaving me. And he goes, Colette, the way I feel about you and our conversations and the passion that you offer and the knowledge that you have, everyone there on, at practice will love you. I'm just confident of that. And I was like, I was, I was probably choke holding him through the phone, you know? <laughs> uh, so I get there and exactly what he said happened, you know, and I had already known the GM for the Jets at that time. It was Mike McCagnan and it was also the VP, mm -hmm. Neil Glatt, the VP of the New York Jets. And I met them before a few times and they saw me on the sideline. At, at a private practice and they're like I'm sure they were like who's this bitch you know who's this person I <laughs> right yeah. mm -hmm. like, cool whatever I'm here and so they were happy to see me and coach the then head coach Todd Bowles who is one of my favorite people in the whole world just a good a quality man just a good guy you want him as a best friend or your husband or your neighbor or just like you want him in your life he's a great person human being he saw his bosses, I guess, talking to me like we were cool. So he wants to know who the hell I am. And we started talking and um, it just happened from there. I mean, it took about almost a year. Um, I believe I was being interviewed within every time I came out to practice because he gave me full uh, unfilled access whenever I wanted to. All I had to do was text the head coach and say, hey, can I come out tomorrow? I'm available this day and he would say of course and if i didn't come out often enough he would give me a text hey the guys are asking about you when you coming back out and i'm like i'm kind of busy right now but i'll be out so and so days that all right and so it just kind of it was very organic you know and i think that that is what a lot of our teams need do we need great coaches yes do we need a back a, a great back system and administration of course but do we need chemistry and love and true compassion for the sport? Yes. And I believe that was an element that I brought coupled with the knowledge that I had. So it was pretty seamless and I loved it. It's hard to miss your passion for the game and the game well played. When you first went out there sort of as a coach, did you realize the position you were in? There's been a couple no. women coaches, but you are the first African American no. woman coach. No, I did not. So it was only after the I fact. After the fact, yes. I went there. I remember packing up my bag. I called up a neighbor to say, "Hey, feed my cat." He, Charlie, my cat's <laughs> name is Charlie. He's such an asshole too. Um, <laughs> As all good cats are. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I feel like I'm going to take care of my cat. I packed up my stuff, put it in my, my, my car, put the top down, drove to Jets training camp, you know, and I just went there to do my job and for my favorite team. Yeah. So no, for me, it was like, I'm going there to do work for a job that I know I'm going to love. And that's all it was. And it wasn't until I got there that I was like, as soon as I pulled up at the gate, security was like, oh yeah, hey, yeah. and I was like, <laughs> I'm looking behind me like, what, what, you know, because I mean, I want one day for that not to be a big parade. I mean, do we mm -hmm. want a parade for ourselves? Okay. Yes. Give me a parade. But <laughs> when it comes to the totality about women and positions right. that are usually unorthodox, right? I don't want a parade for that. I want it to be commonplace. So I didn't realize it until time went in. I really didn't. It was just, I was going there to do my job. I have written down this question that I think I, I know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What kind of coach are you? Are you sort of the stoic kind pacing the sidelines? Or are you the one throwing things and screaming at people who mess up? When you say throwing things, like throwing things like what? <laughs> uh, you know, your clipboard, your, you know, whatever. If someone just can't execute what you're asking them to do. I think I'm both of those coaches. It depends on the, it depends on the moment. It depends on the player or what I call the personnel. Right. Um, if I've told you, 
a few times or not. The first time, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to grab your face mask and pull you down and be like, what the hell did I just say? <laughs> right? I won't do that probably till three times in. You know, the first time is like, come on, we went through this. What's the problem? Right? So I'm more of let's get to the problem. Let's get to the root of why you're not able to execute. Right? And then you got to write, you got to draw it out. You got to say, okay, look, if we're in a 4-3 and we're in a cover three, your position is here. He's here. He's got that. Don't worry about him. Do your job. You know, so it starts off like that. But then after a while, I'm like, get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> and then two seconds later, I'm like, okay, come here. Because <laughs> I got to explain it. I got to, you know, so I don't know. I think, I think, I think I brought a different element to being um, motherly, nurturing, right? Because am I tough? I am, I'm tough after the fact. You know, what I really wanna do is engage. I know that my parents, especially my father, whenever I got in trouble, he would sit me down and explain to me why I'm in trouble and why he's disappointed. And that was more effective than him beating me with a belt yeah. Locking me in my bedroom with no TV. For him to say I'm disappointed because we told you X, Y, and Z. Here's what you did. It doesn't add up to what we asked you to do, but you did it anyway. So I think I bring that aspect of I don't know. I think I, I want to say a family, a family affair, a, a nurturing time, like. I don't want to beat anybody up until I really need to beat your ass up. <laughs> and then watch out. <laughs> Time comes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But then I feel like the super like silent treatment is the ultimate you've pissed me off. Like when we've gone beyond the yelling, then when it's like pure silence, that's the really terrifying one. Oh, yeah. Well, if I you had ever a, get to I that point. That was silent to me and it was, it was horrible where it was almost, it took a twisted turn where it didn't do anything positive. I think it right. was so hurtful and so demeaning that it crushed a part of your spirit. So I said, I never want to be a coach like that. I mean, I could yell at you and after I told you three times and you keep doing it. And when I say, you know what, get on my face. But then 30 seconds later, I'm like, okay, come here, come here. I can't, <laughs> like, I can't be that person. You know, I right. want to figure out what the root, the root, the R-O-O-T, the root of the problem is, and let's rectify it. Let's fix it. Yeah. You know, these guys would not be there unless they were exceptional players. Everybody's right. got yeah. strengths and weaknesses. I want to build up your weaknesses. I want to key in and get you, uh, get your strengths better. So, but I also want you not to forget about the love of the game. You know, I want that passion. When you first played football, the same way I remember playing football, I want you to feel that that joy, that sheer love of the game. You know, it's, I mean, look, I get it. It's a thousand cents thing. It's a business. It's an operation. But we're playing this game because we initially, from step A, we loved it. Your whole story is so amazing. And and when you read the whole thing and everything you've overcome and the fact that you sort of found these windows of, I'm going to make the most of this opportunity and I'm going to take this and I'm going to do everything I can within my power to make the best of the situation and capitalize on it. You know, when, <clears throat> when you look and see that, oh, you're also doing motivational speaking, it seems like a no brainer because of your ability to say like, yeah, this has been hard. This has not been a cakewalk, but I'm going to make the best of my opportunities that are presented to me. I'm not finished. Like I'm not finished. Like I, life is still hard um, for a lot of people, but I can just say for a black girl and now a black woman, I discovered who I am. 
And that is very helpful. It's very beneficial to me. And I want to feed other people. I got fed some great lessons through football. And I'm like, oh my gosh, why is this a secret? We should all be happy. <laughs> right? So I bring yeah. that to, you know, marginalized communities. And it's just, you know, when you walk into a school where all the kids are black, you know, their clothes are tethered. The teachers may not be the greatest because they're just, it's for, in, in their brains, they're correction officers just passing the time. And when you see that it breaks your heart, but when they, when the principal announces who I am, we have Colette V. Smith, the NFL's first African-American female coach in the history of the National Football League and the first female coach of the New York Jets franchise and a former women's pro full type of football player. The kids are like, wait, what? And they're whispering like, oh, hell no. <laughs> and I love it. And I love it. Let's go. And I go up there and I may wear some high heels and a sexy Gucci dress. The minute I open up my mouth, let's go. Because if you're doubting me, I know you're doubting yourself. I know you're doubting your sister and your mama. Why are we doing this? Don't you see your greatness? Have we looked for it? Where is it? Everyone reach in your pocket, pull out the greatness, right? So it is like, it is eye-opening. And I think it's very cathartic for me because I'm not done. My healing is not done. You know, I'm a five-time rape survivor. I'm a three-time suicide survivor. At least the times that I was hospitalized for it. I've thought about it numerous times. And then football came into my world. And then I am wearing a superhero cape, right? So it's like, wait a minute, I can't leap that building? Says who? <laughs> I'm going to train for it. So it is, a, it is a process for me still to this very day. And I think that we all go through processes. And I just want I just want a level playing field for all people, for all people, for all people. And look, is it great if your mom and your dad had these amazing careers and they're making great money and you have a home with a backyard and your own bedroom and your own stuff. Great. But for all the children, and there's so many more that don't have, I want them to know their worth. I want them to know that they're valuable. I want them to know you can push the envelope if you believe in yourself. And that's why my company is called Believe in You Incorporated. So for me, it I'm not just helping them. I am on a continuous journey of self-healing. You know, I may have a great day one day and the next day I'm like, what am I doing? What is it? I think it's called the imposter syndrome or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I have I tell myself, oh bitch, please stop. You ain't shit. Okay, whatever. You coach that one year, whatever. That's over now. Stop. And then I'm like, no, but who can say that? Well, hell I can. And I'm going to use it. So it's an up and down battle, you know, and I think that a lot of people need that, including myself to this very day. Well, I think that's huge. I think that so much that comes from what you're providing to others and how it comes back to you that that whole cycle, because I also think it continues to preach how real it is and how real these battles are. Cause I see people all the time who are motivational speakers that sure they'll tell you about the struggle at the beginning, but then all of a sudden, no, I made all this money and everything's oh, amazing oh, now. I got an Island, right? <laughs> it's like, no, it, it never ends. And you've reinvented yourself and done these things over and over and survived all this stuff. Like that's what kids and adults and people need to see is that you do keep mustering that strength and killing those barriers. And yeah. it doesn't matter how young, how old you are, all those things. And it, that sets you apart, I think. It doesn't matter, right? And, and and every day is a struggle, right? Every day is a struggle. Yesterday might've been a great day. The next day I may be crying, 
hugging my asshole cat that I love to piece his name Charlie. <laughs> yeah. And he's hitting I'm like, you're gonna love me, I don't care. <laughs> yes, fourth one. You know what I mean? It's like every day is a struggle and it's a learning experience that you grow from. And when I come through it the next day, I'm very proud. I'm very proud, you know, and I know that when I speak to my dad, I know he's proud of me. And, you know, I, I tell these children all the time when I do these speaking engagements as, as same thing at corporate, I do corporate events and I tell them, do you, let's go back to time. Let's go back in time. And, you know, let's talk about that time. You had a really good grade and you couldn't wait to get home to tell your mom and dad, that's good grade to show them that a circled in red, a, you know, I said, didn't that feel good? And they're like, Oh my God. Yeah. I'm like, and how many times did you get a bad grade that you were not hoping to see, have them see? I said, it happens, right? And they're like, oh yeah. I said, well, look, it's an everyday struggle to make your parents proud, to make your parents, I'm 51 years old. I still wish to make my parents proud. Well, I know I don't want to take up all your time, uh, but this is, this has been wonderful. I don't know sort of, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I want to go run laps and, uh, yeah, that, that inspiration. Wanna, yeah. You can just feel it. Like you can feel it through the, our listeners will be freaking out in a good way. Cause they'll, you can feel your energy and everything exudes from you, even through the airwaves. For more information on Colette V. Smith and to learn about how to get in touch with her for speaking engagements, you can visit her website. And the website is believe, the letter N, U, Inc, I N C, dot com. You can follow us on all the various socials. Our website is whythepodcast.com and has all sorts of additional stories and videos. It's also where you can sign up for our newsletter. We're also on YouTube if you're into that kind of thing. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes, because if you don't, we'll call your mother and tell her that she's completely right. You would look so much prettier if you smiled more. Why the Podcast is part of Mudhouse Media. Today's show was produced by myself and Heidi Hegquist. Our reluctant executive producers are John Sobe and Sandy Stone. Our willing executive producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Chinette. Our graphic designer is Samantha Mustonen. The theme song was performed by the Electrosynth O Magnetic Polyphonic Orchestra. This one's for Philippe. Thanks for joining us. Flash, we're coming home. Nigel, is that you? Are you here, Nigel?